Have we solved the problem of nuclear waste? Here's some music to scare you. If you live in one of these countries, you have a problem. These are the places that are sitting on over 100 tons of radioactive, high-level nuclear waste. This is the deadly waste that has been slowly piling up from power plants, hospitals, and weapons programs for the past 70 years. And it's dangerous and costing you money. Nuclear waste is going to keep building and building until we're completely overwhelmed and the whole planet becomes a toxic wasteland. At least, that's what some people would have you believe. That it's going to bankrupt us. And there's no way to deal with something so dangerous that's going to be so radioactive for thousands of years. And the solution is to do what? Stop everything, sit on our hands, and do nothing? The problem appears so difficult and so overwhelming that it feels like the only solution is to do nothing. Nuclear energy has been shown to be a reliable, low-carbon source of energy to meet our growing needs, but with it comes the issue of nuclear waste. We've seen a huge shift in the acceptance of nuclear power in just the last even two or three years, especially as a means to meet targets for carbon emissions. The number of new plants announced and starting constructions is the highest it's been in a long time. The vast majority of these are similar to the over 400 reactors that are already operating around the world. And these plants are continuously generating literally tons of nuclear waste that must be dealt with, potentially for a very, very long time. Up to tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of years. Regardless of your position on nuclear power, the fact is that it does exist. And we must do something with all of that waste. It's certainly too dangerous to leave lying around or just bury it and forget about it, right? If you look at what we do now, it seems we've managed to find some solutions here and there. But are these really sustainable for the long term? After all, if we had the answers, wouldn't we see them being implemented everywhere? So while we continue to pile up more and more, let's dive in and see what the reality of the situation is of nuclear waste. Like every other type of energy producing technology, nuclear energy does make some waste products throughout the lifetime of a plant. When a nuclear reactor is operating, it will produce a variety of waste from everyday things like the workers' gloves and tools, to components, filters and water treatment, to the spent uranium fuel itself. The most common types of plants rely on uranium fuel and water for cooling, so that's where most of the waste has come from. Other types of reactors I'll get to later, so be sure to stick around. Now, all of these products can broadly be called nuclear waste because they give out some amount of radiation. This radioactivity could be harmful if it was released out into the environment, so we have to take certain measures to protect it. We do this by categorizing nuclear waste into different groups, depending on how radioactive it is. The first is low-level waste, which makes up 90% of the total volume of waste from a nuclear plant. These are lightly contaminated items, like tools or clothing, used by the employees working in the plant. They're normally not very contaminated, and typically can be stored in the plant until the radioactivity has decayed away enough that these items can be disposed of as ordinary trash or possibly sent off to a special low-level waste facility where it can be buried. The next category is intermediate-level waste, which makes up about 7% of the total volume. This can be things like filters, steel components from the reactor, or concentrated products like wastewater. This kind of waste may require isolation for many years, but generally isn't so radioactive that things like continuous cooling are required. This kind of waste typically can be buried underground at a depth of 10 to 100 meters. Now the last category is what people normally think of when they hear nuclear waste, and that's high-level waste. This is mostly the spent nuclear fuel that has already operated inside the reactor. However, by volume, it's pretty small. It makes up only about 3% of the total waste. But by radioactivity, it's by far the largest, accounting for 95% of all the categories of nuclear waste. It also continuously gives off heat and will need to be safely managed for thousands of years. That's why when we talk about nuclear waste, it's usually high-level waste that we're worried about. But how dangerous is it really? Although spent nuclear fuel is a hazard, one thing we do need to keep in mind is that the volume of waste is relatively small compared to other sources. It'll vary, but an individual person's electricity needs in a developed country for an entire year would produce as little as 5 grams of high-level waste, the same weight as a single sheet of paper. Scaled up to a typical 1,000 megawatt nuclear station, which is enough for 3 million people, it would produce only 3 cubic meters of high-level waste per year if the used fuel is recycled. In comparison, a 1,000 megawatt coal plant will produce around 300,000 tons of ash and more than 6 million tons of carbon dioxide every year. And unlike the solid nuclear waste that is kept controlled on the site at the plant, most of the coal waste goes up into the atmosphere, 
Air pollution from coal and other fossil plants is directly responsible for millions of deaths each year, estimated to be as high as one in five deaths worldwide, according to a Harvard study in 2021. So in summary, nuclear plants produce a relatively small volume of solid spent nuclear fuel that can be controlled, while fossil plants freely send large amounts of carbon dioxide and ash up into the atmosphere. But as you probably know, that doesn't mean that spent nuclear fuel is harmless. There are serious health and environmental risks that must be managed when dealing with high-level waste. Direct exposure at one meter from freshly discharged spent nuclear fuel will kill a person within minutes, if not seconds, and it won't be pretty. Another thing to keep in mind is that radioactive material decays over time to become less toxic. After the first 10 years, spent nuclear fuel will lose about 85% of its radioactivity, and after 100 years, it loses 98%. That last 2% is still dangerous though, and will take upwards of 100,000 years to decay away. So we have to protect people and the environment, and we do that by shielding the radiation. Luckily, we know how to do this very well. When the spent fuel is freshly removed from a reactor, it is usually under about 10 meters of water, in an area of the plant cleverly named the spent fuel pool, or spent fuel pond. The spent fuel will spend at least five years here, but possibly longer, up to 20 years. Since the spent fuel is very radioactive and still gives off a fair amount of heat, covering it in water in the spent fuel pool does two things. One, water is a pretty good shield for radiation, so it's effective, inexpensive, and easily replaced. And two, the water provides cooling to the spent fuel, since it gives off some heat. But this does mean that the spent fuel pool needs continuous cooling and additional water to counter evaporation, or eventually the water will heat up and boil off. As the water level drops, that means the water that was shielding and cooling the spent fuel will eventually disappear and directly expose the spent fuel to the atmosphere. This could lead to the solid fuel degrading and releasing radioactive particles. So the spent fuel pool needs essentially continuous cooling through pumps and heat exchangers to maintain the appropriate temperatures and water levels to make sure the fuel remains covered in the pool. Okay, we know high-level waste is dangerous, so what are we doing with it? Well, the short answer is not much. Around the world, the majority of the spent fuel is stored at the same site that produced it, in those pools. Most plants are designed to have a capacity of around 20 years worth of on-site storage space. This means that all the spent nuclear fuel can be underwater in a concrete building that is attached to the main reactor building for a very long time. Long term, there has been a debate for decades about what to do with nuclear waste. In the US, by law, the Department of Energy is responsible to accept and handle the nation's spent nuclear fuel. This has been the on-again, off-again argument around Yucca Mountain. Up until 2013, the Department of Energy was collecting around $750 million per year, which had accumulated into almost $45 billion in its nuclear waste fund before a lawsuit ended the fees. Essentially, political fighting made it impossible to make any progress on a permanent solution, so nothing got done. This left the individual nuclear plant sites with an increasing amount of spent nuclear fuel that the federal government was supposed to take. Since many of these plants were only designed to hold 20 years worth of fuel, the pools were slowly filling up and running out of space. Not seeing a solution coming anytime soon, the plants started removing some of the spent fuel from the pools of water and placing them into large, dry metal and concrete casks that are stored outside the plant. These dry casks are cooled naturally by the air instead of water pumps like in the spent fuel pool. And because the concrete and metal are much denser than water, these provide the necessary radiation shielding so much so that it is possible to stand right next to them without any danger. By moving the used nuclear fuel out of the pools, the dry casts free up more space in the pools for the plants to keep operating, while providing a simple solution. Because they're air-cooled, they don't require electricity for pumps or heat exchangers, making them more reliable in the event that power is lost. And because they don't have any moving parts, maintenance is essentially just checking the integrity of the concrete and metal. That's why dry storage systems like this are designed to last for about 100 years, with almost no human upkeep needed. The San Onofre plant, which operated continuously from 1968 to 2012, removed all of its spent fuel and stored it on site while the plant undergoes decommissioning. Nearly 50 years of fuel is contained entirely here, in these casks next to the plant. And this is a common practice across the industry, storing spent nuclear fuel at the same sites that produced it. In the US, there are nearly 100 of these dry storage spent fuel sites across the country. And don't think that this type of storage is any less secure than keeping it in a building. To demonstrate it could survive an impact from an aircraft, 
the company Holtec went to the U.S. Army's proving grounds in Aberdeen, Maryland, and fired a missile at their cask. It survived with no breach of its integrity. But even if they are robust enough to survive shocks and last a hundred years, dry storage is a temporary solution for something that needs to be managed for thousands of years. And this is where we get into the slightly more political and technical debate of what do we really do with all this waste in the long term? The first thing to recognize is that the total amount of waste we're talking about here really isn't all that much, at least not compared to the amount of energy we've gotten out of nuclear power plant operations. One of the positive things about nuclear energy is its density. And that means the total waste produced from over 70 years of operating nuclear plants in the US reasonably fits under a football field. That's the whole volume of waste we're talking about here. Of course, it's not practical to move all of that spent fuel around all at once. And that's why specialized transport casks were developed to move the spent nuclear fuel from one place to another. This does happen for various reasons, and over the last 60 years, more than 2,500 cast shipments occurred in the US, and close to 50,000 shipments around the world, with no recorded incidents of radiation release. And if you think transporting nuclear waste is dangerous, that's a fair point. We've already talked about how it could be lethal if it was released into the environment, but again, there have been no accidents of radiation release while transporting used fuel. One look at the testing done on the transport casks, and it's no surprise. These things are built like a tank. Well, actually, tanks wish they were built like transport casks. In 1978, Sandia National Labs in the Southwest US went full Mythbusters style and conducted tests to demonstrate just how robust these things are. One of those tests included crashing a truck, powered by literal rockets, carrying a cask into a solid concrete wall at 60 miles an hour or 100 kilometers an hour. The cask took so little damage that, because why not, they put it on another rocket truck and crashed it into the wall a second time even harder, at 84 miles an hour or 135 kilometers an hour. It completely survived. In another test, a truck was set across a railroad track where it was struck broadside by a rocket-powered train going 81 miles an hour or 130 kilometers an hour. Again, the cast survived intact with minimal damage. Another test used a rail car to crash a cask into a concrete wall at 81 miles an hour or 130 kilometers an hour. But after surviving that, the cask and the rail car were put over a pool of jet fuel and burned in the flames for 90 minutes. The results showed that the internal temperatures were not even close to being hot enough to melt the fuel, and the spent fuel inside would have been protected even through the combination of the crash and the burn. So I think it is fair to say we have safely figured out how to transport nuclear waste. As far as what we do with spent nuclear fuel, there are a few options. The first is to accept that the spent fuel is done and ready to be disposed of. The overwhelming scientific consensus on this is that putting the waste into deep geological formations that are expected to be stable for millions of years is appropriate. There are a few different options, but the spent fuel can be converted into a stable solid like glass, encased in a container, and buried into the bedrock or underground salt. Finland has been the leader of this at its Onkolo facility. Here, a large network of underground tunnels has already been dug deep into the granite rock. Then a series of vertical shafts will create space for canisters containing the spent fuel. As each section fills up, it is then backfilled with clay. The entire process is largely done remotely, further reducing the risk of any personnel contamination. Because the area is so stable and there's essentially no geological movement, canisters in this kind of rock and clay formation are expected to last almost indefinitely even if groundwater becomes present. If the canisters eventually succumb to corrosion many thousands of years into the future or longer, it will still take many thousands more years for any radioactive particles to migrate far enough away from the site to reach whoever might be outside. And by that time, the radioactivity will have decayed so low that it will be undetectable compared to naturally occurring background radiation anyway. This is why these types of deep, bedrock disposal sites have the scientific consensus as a safe way to dispose of nuclear fuel. Another alternative to this type of geological disposal is instead of digging a series of tunnels like you'd see in a mine, to instead drill very deep, narrow wells called boreholes. These are typically used by the oil and gas industry for exploring or reaching pockets of fossil fuels. However, that same technology can be used to dig long channels that can be then used to send nuclear waste down before backfilling. The advantage these have over the traditional repository is that it's possible to go much, much deeper, down to around 5,000 meters or about 10 times as far. 
This means the waste can be placed below any potential water sources that may come in the future and into extremely stable rock that will never see the surface, probably for millions of years. And by that time, the waste will have decayed away into nothing. A current leader in this approach has been a company called Deep Isolation. They claim that each section of their deep bore wells can hold up to 10 years worth of waste from a typical nuclear reactor. And considering the overall effort of drilling small sections is much less than mining an area large enough to fit a truck, the cost should be more competitive too. However, if we don't want to directly throw away used nuclear fuel, there are alternatives to burying it in the ground. Most of the material in used nuclear fuel can actually be recycled. In fact, about 97% of the material in spent fuel could be extracted and used again in other reactors. Countries like France, India, and Russia all practice some amount of this recycling. The focus has mostly been on extracting uranium and plutonium from the spent fuel, since these materials can be used in conventional reactors. The fission products that are the most radioactive parts of the spent fuel are separated out. This has the added benefit of greatly reducing the volume of waste. It is these separated waste products that could then be suitably disposed of in the geologic repository, rather than throwing out the other 97% of the material with it. The largest of these facilities is in La Hague, France, which has operated for decades and possesses about half of the world's spent fuel recycling capacity. The reprocessed fuel is then sent out to be used again, while the concentrated waste products are stored on site. Another option for spent nuclear fuel that has been demonstrated, albeit only on a small scale, is to use it directly in a different type of reactor. While most nuclear plants are operated using water around the fuel, it's possible to design special reactors that use other materials, like liquid sodium, lead, or salts. When these type of reactors are fueled, they can take not only enriched uranium like most reactors, but other materials like thorium, or even spent nuclear fuel from other reactors. Because these types of special reactors are much more efficient, these designs can reuse our existing spent fuel for hundreds, if not thousands of years. One of the largest and best examples of this is the Russian BN-800 fast reactor, which entered commercial operation in 2020. It uses sodium as the coolant and operates initially with an enriched uranium core. It was originally intended to consume plutonium from old nuclear weapons, but could be loaded with spent nuclear fuel from traditional reactors in the future. This approach further reduces the waste and is one of the most efficient ways of destroying existing fuel that would otherwise need to be thrown away. The interesting thing is that although all these options exist and have been demonstrated, the answers vary widely by country. Finland has led the efforts for long-term geological storage, with Sweden, France, and Belgium at various levels of study for their own. Finland's Poseva estimates that the total cost of building its disposal facility will be $3.3 billion, which on its own sounds like a lot. But what are we getting for that? If we break it down, that means storing spent nuclear fuel will cost around $600 per kilogram, which adds less than $0.002, or 0.2 cents per kilowatt hour. A typical household will pay anywhere from 10 to 25 cents per kilowatt hour, meaning the cost of the used fuel disposal accounts for only about 1% of the bill. Not exactly the crushing economic burden you might have thought. In the United States, there is a small pilot facility for waste storage deep in New Mexico called the Waste Isolation Pilot Project, but it is only for waste from the nuclear weapons program, meaning commercial nuclear plants still have to rely on dry storage at each site. Because this is a temporary solution, waste can be stored for around $200 per kilogram, but ultimately we still need to do something with it, so this is more of an additional cost, rather than a savings. For recycling, France, India, and Russia all perform reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel, and China is working on their own capabilities with help from the French. Reprocessing fuel is much more expensive than geological storage, coming in at around $2,300 per kilogram, plus an additional $200 per kilogram for storing the waste left over from recycling. The US has generally stayed away from reprocessing, mostly for political reasons. One of the steps in reprocessing is separating out plutonium, which is a key element needed to create nuclear bombs. So in 1977, the US government halted all commercial reprocessing in the country as part of its stance against nuclear weapons proliferation. Since then, there have been a few attempts to change this policy, but with limited success, it doesn't look like it will change anytime soon. And as we've seen with Yucca Mountain, a solution for long-term geological storage in the US is also looking unlikely. Previous proposals were challenged because the requirements were not set to demonstrate the site was suitable for extremely long times, like a million years. While there's no way to predict exactly how the world is going to be in 100,000 years, that doesn't mean the solution is to stop entirely or do nothing. However, the solutions we have for nuclear waste are very, very well understood. 
Using nuclear energy is a known and effective way to reduce carbon emissions on a large, reliable scale. And if you'd like to show off your support for nuclear energy, you can pick up an Everything Happens for a Reason mug. By doing so, you directly support this channel and have something pretty cool to show off to your colleagues. So what do you think? Is the nuclear waste problem solved or are there still too many unknowns? Let me know down in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one.